Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it is all on P10, which is forces and motion. This topic uh, looks at momentum, it also looks a bit at acceleration and also elasticity. Remember, if you haven't already, I am now also making resources, so please check the video description in order to find a link to some amazing science resources. The topic of forces and motion goes into more depth than some of the key principles that we learn in the topic of P8 forces and P9 motion. And we learnt about acceleration in the topic of P8 forces and we looked at um, what acceleration is, that it's the change in velocity divided by the time. Um, and we're gonna look at that in the start of this topic. We're gonna look at Newton's second law of motion. And Newton's second law states that the force is equal to the mass times acceleration and you'll notice I have a calculation triangle for that I like using triangles uh, as it shows how I could rearrange the equation to calculate any of the other parameters so basically what Newton found out is that force is directly proportional to the mass times the acceleration of an object and all this ties in to inertia which basically means that a resultant force is needed to change a velocity. You probably investigated uh, Newton's second law in the laboratory using a pulley and a data logger and you changed the mass attached to the pulley changing the force and increasing the acceleration. We know that if the forces are unbalanced, then we will get an accelerating object. And that's something that Newton's second law uh, explains. However, what happens when then forces eventually become balanced? Due to resistive forces such as air resistance or friction. Take this skydiver, for example. When this skydiver first jumps out of the plane, he starts accelerating downwards and his force going downwards, the gravity pulling him down is greater than the air resistance going up. This will cause the skydiver to accelerate. However, as the skydiver falls, the air resistance that he experiences gets larger as he speeds up until the forces are in balance and this prevents any further acceleration and at this speed this is known as terminal velocity. At terminal velocity you can see the weight is equal to the air resistance. This means that the skydiver is now going at a constant speed. However what is going to happen when this skydiver pulls its parachute? Well, when the skydiver pulls its parachute, the air resistance is now going to be a lot greater as there is a larger volume that the air is hitting. So the air resistance is a lot greater and this means that his force going down his weight is a lot less than the air resistance and this causes the skydiver to decelerate. However, after a certain amount of time, he's going to be going at a constant speed again and the air resistance will once again equal the weight of the skydiver and he will be travelling at a constant speed even though the speed is a lot less. Looking at forces and the balancing of forces is vital in everyday applications. Just think about driving a car for example. You need to know how much force needs to be applied to slow down that car in order to make it stop. Look at this car for example, if it, the forces are in balance, this car is going to be moving at a constant speed. However, to slow this car down, what you need to do is you need to increase the friction and the deceleration to increase the deceleration of this car. And the braking force is going to depend on the mass of the car 
and the speed that that car is already traveling at. If the car is going really fast, then a greater force it will be needed in order to slow it down. And if the car's mass is greater, obviously that will require greater mass, uh, greater force, I mean, to slow it down as well. In this topic though, we don't just look at the forces acting on the car. We look at how um, how far it takes that car to stop, and that's known as stopping distance. And the stopping distance of the car is affected by two factors. And that is the thinking distance. So that is how long it takes you to think before applying your brakes and also your braking distance. And there's different factors that can affect both of these two um, parts. For example, the thinking distance can be affected by whether you've got any distractions. Also, alcohol can affect your, drink, uh, your thinking distance. That's why alcohol uh, is illegal to be drinking and driving because alcohol will increase your thinking distance. It slows down your reflexes. Tiredness is a, another example of uh, another effect that can influence your thinking distance. The more tired you are, the longer it's going to take you to apply those brakes. Now, looking at braking distance, there is factors that would affect that as well. Uh, for example, the conditions of your brakes. That's why your car's going for MOTs uh, to make sure the brakes are all looking good. Also, other things that can affect braking distance, which you might not have uh, control over, is the weather. Uh, if it's rainy or icy, that's going to increase uh, the time it's going to take for you to stop. And also the road surface. If the surface has more friction, then you will slow down faster. The next section on this topic uh, looks at springs and adding forces to springs and how that affects uh, the extension of that spring. And we'll look at a law called Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law states that the force is proportional to the extension of a spring. The extension of a spring is the change in length. So if we look at these two springs here, this spring is unextended and this spring is extended as a weight's been applied to it. So the extension will equal the original, uh, the new length minus the original length is the extension. And if you keep adding weight to measuring the extension, you notice that there is a pattern that forms, and that's due to Hooke's law. So if I was to plot a graph showing what happens as I increase the force to the extension, what you'd notice is you'd get a straight line because they're proportional. And because of that, you can work out a constant in order to uh, be able to calculate different extensions if you were only to know the force. So it's called F equals KF. This parameter K here is what's known as the spring constant. And the spring constant is measured in newtons per meter. Remember the weight, the force, is measured in newtons. So if this was a 10 kilogram weight, it's a uh, 10 kilogram mass, I mean, its weight would be 10 kilograms times uh, 9.8 newtons per kilogram, and that would mean 980 newtons. The next section of this topic looks at a property called momentum, and the momentum of an object is equal to the mass of that object times its velocity. And what is really important to remember is that in a closed system, momentum is always conserved. And we can use this law in order to explain what happens in collisions. For example, if we look at the two cars down here, Momentum will be conserved when they collide with one another. Because we know that the momentum is the mass times the velocity, 
we can work out uh, how fast an object will be moving after a collision because the mass of object A plus the velocity of object A plus the mass of object B plus the velocity of object B will equal zero because momentum will be conserved during a collision. Let's look at an example so you know what I'm on about. Let's look at two cars that are going for a head-on position uh, collision. Let's look at car A and car B. So car A and car B are going for a head-on collision. Car A is traveling at six meters per second and car B is going at four meters per second. Car A weighing, we'll use just small numbers, three kilograms and car B weighing 2.5 kilograms. Now, if these two cars stick together after the collision, we can calculate what momentum they will be moving at due to conservation of momentum. So let's do that. Let's calculate the, uh, the momentum of car A, which is the mass times the velocity, so that's six meters per second, times three kilograms, and that will equal 18 kilograms, per meters per second. Look at the units for momentum. Remember just to times the units together and that will give you the units. And the momentum of B is four meters per second times 2.5 kilograms, which equals 10 kilograms per meters per second. In order to calculate the new momentum, what you need to do is you need to do one minus the other. So you do 18 minus 10, which would give you a momentum of eight kilograms per meters per second. And it would be traveling now in this direction. So it will have a positive momentum. If this one was larger, if B was larger, it would have a negative momentum. But that's not all we can do. We can actually calculate its new velocity. Because of the fact they've stuck together, we can now calculate its velocity because we know its new mass. The mass of it now added together because we're assuming they've stuck together is 5.5 kilograms is the mass. So in order to calculate its um, velocity uh, because momentum is mass times velocity that means that momentum divided by mass will give us velocity which is 1.45 meters per second. Not always do the two objects stick together. So I'm gonna show you another example where the objects do not stick together. Here are two snooker balls, for example, and they are going for a head on, uh, on collision. This one is traveling at 0.28 meters per second, and this one is only going at 0.14 meters per second. Because they're snooker balls, let's assume they both have the same mass at something like 140 grams. So let's calculate what direction they'll be moving in and what their velocity will be after the collision. Well, to do that, we need to know what the velocity of one of the balls is moving after the collision. So let's just assume that we know that the velocity of ball B is going at 0 0.18 meters per second after that collision. So let's calculate what velocity A must be moving in after the collision. Well, to do that, we know that momentum is conserved in um, a collision. So MAVA plus MBVB is equal to the mass of A times the velocity of A plus the mass of B times the velocity of B. And this is before the collision and this is after the collision. So let's put in uh, values that we know already. So the mass is going to stay the same for all of them is 0.14 times the velocity of A, which is 0.28 plus the mass of B, which is 0.14 also and we'll put brackets around it. It'll make it easier in a calculator uh, times the velocity of B, which is 0 
And in fact, that's a negative because it's going in the opposite direction. So we're going to put negatives into this calculation to make it easier. Uh, MA is going uh, in the same direction, but and we know that that's 0 0.14. We don't know what VA is here, and we do know what the mass of B is, and we also know what the velocity of B is after the collision, which is 0 0.18. If you do all of that calculation, uh, you will find out that you will end up with 0 0.0196 equals 0 0.0252 um, plus uh, 0 0.14 times VA. And now we can work out VA by simply doing a subtraction. Uh, on this side, so it'll be 0 0.0196 uh, minus 0 0.0252, and uh, that will equal 0 0.14 times VA. And then you just divide this uh, by 0 0.14, and you will get the velocity of A. which is minus 0 0.04 meters per second. And in fact, this arrow will then be going the wrong way. It would be going that way. So if it was a head-on collision, then A would actually be forced in the opposite direction. If you're doing combined science, you have finished this video. If you're doing triple and GCSE uh, physics, uh, you only have a little bit more to go. So having looked at momentum, we're now going to look at how we can apply momentum for everyday life in order to make appliance more safe. If you have a large change in momentum, you have what is called a large impact force. And having a large impact force can be bad in order of safety. So what car manufacturers need to do uh, is reduce impact force into making cars more safe. And they do this with a few methods. One method they use is they have a crumple zone of a car. And what happens with a crumple zone of the car is at the front of the car. And it basically, it, it means that it takes a longer time uh, for the impact to be spread out over. The reason for this, because the impact force is equal to the mass times the velocity, the change in velocity divided by the time taken. So if we can increase this time taken, then we can uh, decrease the impact force and hopefully make it a lot more safe if you collide. Now, another um, thing that's installed in cars is airbags, and this decreases the impact force on the body. So this means that it takes longer for you to slow down uh, when you collide with your car if you're flung forward in a collision, and therefore the impact force on yourself is less. So it's really important that the momentum of the car is reduced over a longer time in order for the impact force to be less. Thank you for watching this video all on forces and motion. Remember, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. And if you like this video, please drop it a like.